Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Stu Halpern. I serve as the Senior Advisor to the Chief Academic Officer at Yeshiva University, as well as the Senior Program Officer of the Zahav and Moshe Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought. And what I do is bridge the Y and the U of Yeshiva University, bringing together the Yeshiva and the University to produce the next wave of modern Orthodox intellectual leaders. Working closely with Rabbi Dr. Mayor Soloveitchik, who will be giving the keynote address tonight, what we do is train students to learn the Western canon and the Jewish canon in conversation. We bring together the great books of the West and the great books of our Jewish tradition in courses, in reading groups, in book projects, and in public events such as this one. And what emerged from our work at the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought is the idea for this book that we are launching tonight, Proclaim Liberty Throughout the Land, the Hebrew Bible in the United States. So the book, the idea for which was suggested by our co-editor, Dr. Matthew Holbrecht, who's here this evening, was to bring together American sources, foundational American documents from the Puritans, from the very landing on Plymouth Rock, through Lincoln's second inaugural address, side by side with the Hebrew Bible, so Hebrew Bible sources that inspired them. So next to the documents, speeches, letters from the Founding Fathers through Lincoln, we have the Hebrew verses, Be'ivrit, as well as the King James translation that the American thinkers were using at the time. And we show you the foundational impact that the Hebrew Bible has had on the very idea of America and the articulation of its great ideas and ideals. That is Proclaim Liberty. We hope you enjoy it. It will be on sale after Rabbi Soloveitchik's lecture, as well as other books by Yeshiva University Press. And now on to Rabbi Soloveitchik. Rabbi Dr. Mayor Soloveitchik is the director of the Zahava Moshe Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought, as well as the rabbi of Congregation Sherith Israel, the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue in New York City. He graduated Yeshiva College and Yeshiva University's rabbinical school, and he has a PhD in, from Princeton. He has published in many uh, widely read journals and newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal, Commentary Magazine, uh, and beyond. And most importantly, he is a tremendous and beloved mentor of mine, teacher of mine, friend and colleague, my co-editor on Proclaim Liberty, Rabbi Dr. Mayor Soloveitchik. Thank you so much, Stu. Thank you not only for this uh, wonderful introduction and for everything that you did for the book, but for everything that you do for the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought at Yeshiva University. I want to also thank uh, David from Beit Avichai. It's a real pleasure to be here. Hopefully the first of many visits to Beit Avichai, as you said. Thank you, David. <laughs> want to thank Matt Holbreich, who came up with the idea for this book. Say hello to everybody, Matt. There he is. And he's engaged, ladies and gentlemen, which is terrific. Uh, we, Matt came up with this idea some years ago over a sushi dinner, and he said, you know, we should take all of the speeches and documents in American history inspired by the Hebrew Bible and print them side by side with the Hebrew biblical, Hebrew biblical sources that inspired them. And it was Matt's idea, and really, Matt has put in a tremendous amount of work into helping this book come together. We want to thank Matt as well. Thank you, Matt. I also want to thank uh, Jonathan Silver, dear friend of Matthew and myself, who is the fourth co-editor of this book. I want to thank Corin. Matthew Miller is here. Where are you, Matthew? There you are. Uh, and everyone from Corin who really, as you, I hope you'll get the book and you'll see, you'll see this, this is a challenge to lay out a book in a way that you are listing the documents and then the biblical sources, and it was done so exquisitely and so beautifully. Thank you so much to Corin. Now, as Stu mentioned, the heart of our book is a historical testament to the uniqueness of America. The uniqueness of America, as I often say, was captured by America's greatest philosopher and thinker, uh, which is, of course, Yogi Berra. Uh, most people are Americans here from America, or there are some English people. Who's, let's do it for, who here is, is from England? Okay, we're talking about the American Revolution, so it's going to be some microaggressions. Uh, just to consider that a trigger warning. Uh, my, I know it's too soon uh, to joke about it. We'll talk about a little about July 4th, or as you Brits call it, the Nakba. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so it may come up, so 
do not consider this a safe space. So uh, Yogi Berra uh, was once told uh, that the mayor of Dublin, Ireland was Jewish. And the great Yogi ruminated and he said, the mayor of Dublin is Jewish only in America. Okay. <laughs> so that is really essentially what we are trying to express with this book, the uniqueness of the American founding and the American idea. And we gather tonight to celebrate this book that at its core makes the case that a bond with biblical Israel is the foundation of the uniqueness of America. And I will be expanding on this by studying a story that took place long after the, pe the period covered in our book. A story that took place in 1948. A story whose essential details are known to many, whose significance is, I believe, only superficially understood. Let's review the basic facts of this story. During World War I, Lieutenant Harry Truman, stationed in an army training camp in Oklahoma, was assigned to run the regimental canteen. To make it a financial success, Harry Truman took on a partner, a man by the name of Sergeant Edward Jacobson. And here I'm quoting largely from one of my favorite books, which is David McCullough's magisterial biography of Truman. Jacobson's Jewishness, Truman found, was a plus. Quote, I have a Jew in charge of the canteen by the name of Jacobson, and he is Cracker Jack, Truman wrote to his wife Bess, as if that were all the reason anyone would need to expect a profitable outcome. After six months' business was so successful, McCullough writes, that the canteen paid dividends of $10,000, which made Truman and Jacobson extremely popular and led them to conclude that they were an unbeatable business combination. Some of the other officers began kidding Harry, calling him a, quote, lucky Jew, and giving him the nickname Trumanheimer. To this, Truman replied, I guess I should be very proud of my Jewish identity, or my Jewish ability. After the war, Truman and Jacobson went into the shirt business together. The business failed, but they remained friends. Fast forward almost three decades later, and Harry Truman, a failed haberdasher and a member of the Missouri political machine, suddenly became, through a series of unlikely political events, the heir to Franklin Roosevelt and President of the United States. When the United Nations in 1940, while, while the United Nations in 1947 had approved the partition plan never the, for the State of Israel, nevertheless, in early 1948, the American delegation at the UN, under the leadership of Secretary of State George Marshall, sought to revert away from partition, away from Jewish independence, to a UN trusteeship for Palestine. Truman, who revered Secretary Marshall more than any other man alive, and feeling that many American Zionist leaders had been disrespectful to him, refused to meet with any members of the Jewish leadership, including Chaim Weizmann, who had arrived in America specifically to meet with the president. Eddie Jacobson, the only Jew with walk-in privileges to the White House, was asked to plead on Weizmann's behalf. Jacobson was allowed entree into the Oval Office only on the condition that he would not bring up Palestine. He immediately promised not to bring up Palestine, entered the Oval Office, said hello to his old friend, and immediately brought up Palestine. <laughs> Responding to Jacobson, Truman, as McCullough writes, bitterly complained of the abuse he had been subjected to, of how disrespectful and mean certain Jewish leaders had been to him. On a table to the right, writes McCullough, against the wall, was one of the president's prized possessions, a small bronze statue of Andrew, jo of Andrew Jackson on horseback. Pointing to it, Jacobson found himself making an impassioned speech. Harry, he said, all your life you have had a hero. I too have a hero, he said, a man I never met but who is, I think, the greatest Jew who ever lived. I am talking about Chaim Weitzman. He is a very sick man, almost broken in health, but he traveled thousands of miles to meet with you and plead the cause of my people. Now you refuse to see him just because you were insulted by some of our American Jewish leaders, even though you know that Weitzman had absolutely nothing to do with these insults. It doesn't sound like you, Harry, he said to the President of the United States, because I thought you could take this stuff that they have been handing out. As Abba even later wrote, the comparison between Weitzman and Andrew Jackson was unimaginably far-fetched. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just add, never have two more different people ever existed than Andrew Jackson, a man who shot somebody just for saying something not nice about his wife, and Chaim Weitzman. Nevertheless, it worked. 
Truman began drumming his fingers on the desk. He wheeled around in his chair and with his back to Jacobson sat looking out the window into the garden. For what to Jacobson seemed like centuries, neither of them said anything. Then swinging about and looking Jacobson in the eye, Truman said what Jacobson later described as the most endearing words he had ever heard. You win, you bald-headed SOB. I will see him. From the White House, writes McCullough, Jacobson walked directly across Lafayette Square and up 16th Street, where, as never before in his life, he downed two double bourbons. <laughs> Weitzman was secretly herded into the White House, and the UN support for partition was sustained. Then, I'm picking up the story myself, citing other sources, on May 14th, Truman once again overrode Marshall in recognizing the Jewish state, which Marshall did not want him to do. In late May, President Chaim Weitzman of the newly born state of Israel came to Washington where in the White House Rose Garden, he gave the president as a gift a beautiful small Sefer Torah. Truman took the Torah and said, thanks, I've always wanted one of these. And then, after he retired from the presidency, Truman spoke to a Jewish audience in New York. And there, Eddie Jacobson introduced the former president as the man who had helped bring the state of Israel into being. And Truman famously replied, what do you mean, helped? I am Cyrus. I am Cyrus. I, no need to clap. That's not the end of the speech, OK? We still have at least three to four hours to cover, OK? I am Cyrus. Cyrus, of course, or Koresh, is the Persian monarch that allowed Ezra and Zerubbabel to return to Eretz Israel to build the Beit HaMikdash. But he is more than that. Rightly understood, Koresh, or Cyrus, is the most celebrated non-Jew in the Tanakh. Consider this, ladies and gentlemen. Koresh is the only non-Jew accorded the appellation Mashiach, or really even Mashiach Hashem, in the Tanakh, appointed by God to fill a providential role in history. So says Yeshaya, Ko amar Hashem shicho lekoresh. So says God to his anointed. I have given you this empire, God says, Laman avdi Yaakov Yisrael bechirai ve'ekra lecha mishpecha. I have ordained you to act out a providential role on behalf of Israel, my people, for Jacob, my son, and that is why I have called you by name. Moreover, think about this. It is Koresh who is given the last word in all of Tanakh. What's the last Pasuk in the Tanakh? Divar Hayamim concludes with these words. Ko amar Koresh, as if Koresh is a Navi. Ko amar Koresh, Melech Paras. Kol mam lechot ha'aretz natan li Hashem elokei ha'shamayim, hu upakad alai livnot lo bayit b'Yerushalayim. God has chosen me to build his house in Yerushalayim. Mi bachem mi kol amo, Hashem elokav imo v'yav. Whoever is with him is God, let him go up, go up to build the Beit HaMikdash. So ponder this for a moment. The most sacred text of the Jewish faith ends with the words of a non-Jew urging the return to Eretz Yisrael. Thus, this seemingly simple phrase, I am Cyrus, uttered by Truman, should hint to something about Truman himself. While it was indeed Jacobson's friendship that got him into the door, that got Weitzman into the door, the source of Truman's truest motivations on the Israel matter lay in what he sincerely said about the Torah scroll that he received. I always wanted one of these. And the three small words that he uttered to his old, to his old friend, Eddie, I am Cyrus. Meaning, if Truman overcame his reverence for General Marshall to endorse Israel's existence, even, by the way, when Marshall threatened that if Truman did so, he, Marshall, would not support him in the upcoming election, if Truman overcame all the advice of the State Department, it was because of a deeply American affectation for seeing the events of one's own time through the lens of the Hebrew Bible. In this respect, Truman reflects an aspect of America's political DNA and an affectation of the founders, which is reflected in our book, which is the tendency of American leaders to apply in every generation biblical imagery to events that were occurring in their respective times. So in analyzing Truman's words tonight, I will focus on what he might have meant by reviewing the role that the Bible played in the American imagination 
from America's early moments as a country till right after the Civil War, meaning most of the period covered in our book. This, I will argue, will allow us to understand why Zionism may have been part of the American heart and soul much earlier than may have been appreciated. And then in returning to Truman, I will reflect on why those few words, I am Cyrus, are so pregnant with meaning, why rightly understood, they allow a deeper understanding of why we have reason to both celebrate the American past and the American present, but also reason to be concerned for the future. We begin with the beginning of the American Republic and one of my favorite sources in our book. Writing to his wife, Abigail, John Adams, my favorite person in American history, describes how on July 4th, 1776, immediately after approving the Declaration, the Continental Congress appointed Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson to form a committee to design a seal for the United States. Franklin, according to Adams, suggested as the seal an image of, quote, Moses standing on the shore and extending his hand over the sea, thereby causing the same to overwhelm Pharaoh, who was sitting in an open chariot, meaning Krias Yamsuf should be the seal of the United States. Under this image, Franklin added, would appear the following motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Jefferson, in contrast, according to Adams' recollection, suggested a different seal, but also biblical. The children of Israel in the wilderness led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, unfortunately, neither of these excellent suggestions actually caught on. The Congress at this point had a revolution to fight, and when they returned eventually to the question of the national seal, Jefferson and Franklin were already in France, and America ultimately instead adopted as its seal that creepy pyramid with the eye on top of it, which I have no idea what that's about, though I'm given to some reliable information that it has something to do with a treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence. Okay. <laughs> Wanted to see who in Israel would get that reference. Okay. That's, you guys have all seen National Treasure? It's an amazing documentary about the founders. But nevertheless, a committee of three of America's most famous founders is asked to select an image that best embodies their endeavor, and they instinctively select elements of the Pesach story. This points to something extraordinary about America, something that a non-American, indeed someone from Britain, all microaggressions notwithstanding, nevertheless noted. Civil religion, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once wrote, has the same relationship to the United States as Pesach does to the Jewish people. It is not a philosophy, but a story of how a persecuted group escaped from the old world and made a hazardous journey to an unknown land, there to construct a new society, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Like the Pesach story, he said, it defines the nation, not merely in terms of its past, but also as a commitment to the future. Thus, he writes, it is no accident that the founders of America turned to the Hebrew Bible, nor that successive presidents have done likewise, because there is no other text in Western literature that draws these themes, history, providence, the need to fight for freedom in every generation together. Israel, Sotheby Sachs, ancient and modern, and the United States are the two supreme examples of societies constructed in conscious pursuit of an idea." End quote. What this means is that in creating a tiny new nation that overthrew a mighty empire, the founders saw echoes of the Hebrew Bible in their own lives, and they identified, therefore, with the leaders whose stories were told in Tanakh. In her biography of Sandy Koufax, Jane Levy describes Koufax's famous refusal to pitch for the Dodgers in the first game of the World Series because it fell out on Yom Kippur. Coach Walter Alston chose the great Don Drysdale to pitch in Koufax's stead, but the Dodgers got hammered. The score was 7-1 to one when Alston came to the mound to take Drysdale out of the game. Hey, Skip, Drysdale joked, bet you wish I was Jewish today, too. <laughs> For Jews, Levy writes, this loss was a win. If Big D could joke about being one of the chosen people, that was already something, a tacit acknowledgement of their acceptance into the mainstream. Shtetl, farewell. Shtetl, farewell. Side note, by the way, Yogi Berra's yard site Zechor Tzadok Levracha, is on Yom Kippur, the 50th Yom Kippur from the Yom Kippur that Sandy Koufax didn't pitch. We'll have to do the gematrias to figure out the significance, but uh, there it is nevertheless. So if Big D could identify with being one of the chosen people, that was enough. But the truth is, is that one of the most marvelous and miraculous aspects of America 
is that its founders and greatest figures identified deeply with the story of the chosen people. And so our story, meaning the biblical story of Israel, as a model for America. And unlike Drysdale, they meant it in all seriousness. It is the Ramban in Breshit who famously elucidates the notion of Ma'aseh Avot Siman Lebanim, that what occurred to our ancestors is reenacted in the rhythms of Jewish history. The case our book makes is that for the founders, Ma'aseh Yisrael Siman Lemerakayim, the story of the Jewish past was seen by the founders as reflected in its own way in the American story. And this, in turn, inspired the early Americans to warmly welcome the Jews that were among them. This can be seen from another extraordinary text. In 1789, George Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States, and every religious denomination in America reached out to the president with letters of congratulations. So all the Catholics in America came together and sent Washington one letter. The Quakers all came together and sent him one letter. All the Baptists in America came together and sent him one letter. The Jews in America could not agree who would write the letter, <laughs> so they sent him three letters. By the way, there's maybe a thousand Jews in America at the time. Three letters they sent him. Okay? And thank goodness they did because Washington penned a separate exquisite response to each one. The most famous is the letter that he sent to the Jews of Newport. By the way, I'll be reading the letter that Moses Satius of Newport wrote to Washington. I will be reading that in Toro Synagogue this, uh, this coming Sunday uh, in Newport. In the synagogue, they say Washington visited that synagogue. And if he stayed in the synagogue for a sermon, then they could put up a sign in the synagogue that says, George Washington slept here. Okay. <laughs> no need to applaud jokes about rabbis. That's sensitive. So the most famous is what he sends to the Jews of Newport, which closes with its own biblical reference to the prophecy of Micha. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. But even more amazing, but much less well known, is the way Washington concluded his correspondence with the Jews of Savannah. Quote, May the same wonder-working deity who long since delivering the Hebrews from their Egyptian oppressors planted them in the Promised Land, whose providential agency has lately been conspicuous in establishing these, he these United States as an independent nation, still continue to water them, meaning the Jews, with the dews of heaven and to make the inhabitants of every domination participate in the temporal and spiritual blessings of that people whose God is, and then he gives the Hebrew name of God, which we do not pronounce. We welcome you, Washington says, not only as Americans, but as Jews. And we do so because your faith, your story, inspires us. We see reflections of your story in our story. The, this is really, Misha Asan Nisim Lavoteno, right? That's what he's saying. The God who saved you from tyranny saved us from tyranny. Moreover, he is also saying that this God who blessed you in the past, he is blessing you still, and we are blessed, we are blessed by the ability of seeing the unfolding of our history as a reflection of what occurred to you. And Maase Avot Siman Lebanim. This is what the Hebrew Bible meant to the early Americans. Several years later, the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow visited Newport, and he stood in the cemetery that held the graves of the Jews that Washington once visited. There he pondered these interesting Sephardic names that he saw. And then he reflects on the resilience of the Jewish people, on the source of their endurance. And he thinks that the secret, Longfellow writes, is their connection of past to future. There are negative parts in the poem, by the way. But about this connection, he says something beautiful, and he writes the following about the Jewish people. For in the background figures vague and vast of patriarchs and of prophets rose sublime, and all the great traditions of the past they saw reflected in the coming time. That's what he says. Longfellow poetically and precisely captures what Mase Avot Siman Lebanim means for Jews, but it captures as well how American statesmen and citizens saw the Bible as reflected in their own age. And this tendency led Americans to take the next step. Biblical, if biblical history continues to replay itself in new and fascinating forms, if it reflects and refracts in the unfolding of America's story, well then, if Ezra under Cyrus could go to the Holy Land, why could the Jews not return to the Holy Land again? And if America itself features an echo of the biblical story, perhaps America could play a role in the Jews' return. 
And this notion occurred actually to Americans, Jewish and non-Jewish, long before it was raised in Europe. In 1818, Mordecai Manuel Noah, Jewish playwright and politician and journalist, spoke to my synagogue, Congregation Sheirith Israel in New York, the oldest congregation in America. We don't like to mention that, except pretty much every day. And there he delivered passionately praise to the United States. Until the Jews can recover their ancient rights and dominions and take their rank among the governments of the earth, said Noah, this is their chosen country. But Noah was convinced half a century before Herzl that the Jews could return to the Holy Land and create their own state. Quote, Never were the prospects for the restoration of the Jewish nation to their ancient rights and dominion more brilliant than they are at present. Noah sent this speech and his later writings to three retired presidents, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. Adams wrote back twice, and in, two th and in 1819, we mark this year the 200th anniversary of this letter, Adams wrote a reply where he wrote as follows, quote, I could find it in my heart to wish that you had been at the head of 100,000 Israelites, indeed as well disciplined as a French army, and marching with them into Judea and making a conquest of that country, and restoring your nation to the dominion of it, for I really wish the Jews again in Judea an independent nation. This is John Adams, more than six decades before Herzl, endorsing Mordecai Noah's plans. Several years later, Noah took steps to actualize his dreams, and he purchased Grand Island near Buffalo, New York, in order to create a haven for persecuted Jews from all over the world. He named it Ararat, because his name is Noah, and that's where the Teva of Noah landed in Ararat. Noah stressed that Jews finding refuge in America in this Ararat was only the first step to a Jewish restoration in the Holy Land. In calling the Jews together under the protection of the American Constitution, said Noah, it is proper for me to state that this asylum is temporary. The Jews never should and never will relinquish the just hope of retaining possession of their ancient heritage. America, Noah argued, was a divinely ordained opportunity for the Jews of the world to seize control of their own destiny by coming to a colony in America and then proceed from there to the land of Israel. The time has come, he said, the time has emphatically arrived to do something calculated to benefit ourselves and we must commence the work in a country free from ignoble prejudices and legal disqualifications. It was the freedom of America, Noah thought, where Jews could escape persecution and from there launch their return to the Holy Land. So he published advertisements throughout Europe saying, come to America, Jews. Come to Ararat. But his plan was ridiculed by Western European Jewish leaders. Eastern European Jewish uh, Jews never even saw the advertisements, and no Jews came. Today, only the plaque that Noah placed near Grand Island memorializes Ararat. Noah's mistake, of course, was locating the temporary Jewish homeland in Buffalo, New York. If he had built it in Florida, Jews from all over the world would have come instantly. Yet, Students of the story cannot fail to ponder what might have been. Perhaps, writes the historian Robert Gordis, one cannot blame the leaders of West European Jewry for being hidebound by the political and religious conventions of their age, but they might have stimulated a mass Jewish exodus from Europe 50 years earlier and saved untold lives from Hitler's Holocaust had they possessed something of the grandiose vision of Noah. There was, however, one man in America, John Adams, entirely in sympathy with Noah's vision, and this man had himself seen how nations can miraculously rise as a beacon of liberty to the world. This was the Hebraic imagination of the American founders. But the biblical poetry, as we note in the book, reached its most exquisite form in the founder's greatest successor, Abraham Lincoln, who applied biblical verse and the poetry of the King James Bible to America's greatest challenge, the Civil War. Lincoln called America an almost chosen people, by which he meant that America had a covenant just like Israel, but was also, because they had a covenant, under judgment by God when they violated their covenant. The covenant of America was the proposition that all men are created equal. The Declaration of Independence is the Brit of America. Thus, traveling to his inauguration from Illinois, Lincoln stopped in Philadelphia in 1861 and stood near Independence Hall. And he said, quote, all my political warfare has been in favor of the teachings coming forth from that sacred hall. May my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if ever I prove false to those teachings. So Lincoln is saying that the home of the Declaration 
to the Jerusalem of America because it was there that their covenant was formed. Now, of course, the phrase, if I forget thee, O Philadelphia, does not really have the same ring to it. But, and the original Jerusalem remained on Lincoln's mind. As the historian Alec Guelzo reports, according to Mary Lincoln, President Lincoln, on the last day of his life, thought about life after the presidency, after he retired, was planning to retire, what, what he would do when he retired. And he told Mary, she reported, that he would like to visit the Holy Land and that, quote, there was no city on earth he so much desired to see as Jerusalem. Tragically, the man who began his presidency, invoking implicitly, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, was never able to conclude his presidency and achieve his dream of actually seeing Jerusalem. But his closest political comrade is Secretary of State William Seward, as I noted in my Tikva Tishabov talk video, which you may have seen, visited the Holy Land in 1871. A memoir of Seward's visit describes how entranced Seward was in witnessing at the Wailing Wall the endurance of the Jews rooted in their refusal to forget Jerusalem, the embodiment of their covenant with God. His memoir, written together, I think, with his son, reports as follows. The Jewish Sabbath being on Saturday and beginning on sunset on Friday, the weekly wail of the Jews under the wall takes place on Friday and is a preparation for the rest and worship of the day which they are commanded to keep holy. The small rectangular oblong area, this is the alley that was the Kotel, without roof or canopy, serves for the gathering of the whole remnant of the Jewish nation in Jerusalem. Here, whether it rains or shines, they come together at an early hour, old and young, men and women, and little children, the poor and the rich in their best costumes, discordant as the diverse nations from which they come. They are attended by their rabbis, each bringing the carefully preserved and elaborately bound text of the Book of Lamentations of Jeremiah. Meaning, Tishabov was every Arab Shabbos for them. For many hours, they pour forth their complaints, I'm quoting parts of it, bathing the stones with their kisses and tears. It is no formal ceremony. And then Seward writes, during the several hours while we were spectators of it, there was not one act of irreverence or indifference. So William Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State, stands at the Kotel watching the Jews mourn for several hours. And while much has changed in Yerushalayim since Seward visited the Kotel, one feature remains the same. After standing at the Kotel, Seward and his friends got waylaid by a rabbi who tried to bring them to Shabbos davening. <laughs> he succeeds, and he brings them to the Churva, which had just been recently rebuilt. Seward, in giving this whole description, gives this chapter a heading, a quote from the Hebrew Bible. Walk about Zion, mark her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generations following. Seward cites, in other words, a biblical verse not about Jerusalem in its destruction, but about Zion in all its glory, because he understood seeing Jerusalem through Jewish eyes, that if one remembers Jerusalem as it once was, one can not only see it as it once was, but one can envision it being so once again. Or as Longfellow put it, in all the great traditions of the past, they saw reflected in the coming time. This is the span of time covered by our book, from America's earliest moments till after the Civil War. And it allows us to understand how, when we fast forward to 1948, to Truman's own support for Israel's formation, we are now able to understand that this support was rightly understood a natural extension of early American affectations. Clark Clifford, who was Truman's f domestic policy advisor, a young guy who took on Tru uh, Marshall, the senior statesman of America, in these private meetings about Palestine and the future of Israel, and argued vociferously for Israeli independence. Clark Clifford has noted in his own descriptions of Truman that Truman's, quote, own reading of ancient history in the Bible made him a supporter of the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, even when others who were sympathetic to the plight of the Jews were talking of sending them to places like Brazil. But what is noteworthy, ladies and gentlemen, is Truman's fascinating phrase, which he uttered several years after he left the White House, uttered it before an American Jewish audience. I am Cyrus. I am Cyrus. Let us ponder this once more. Unlike the earlier imagery invoked by the founders or by Lincoln, 
In this statement, Truman is not comparing America to biblical Israel, but rather to Persia and God's anointed emperor of Persia. Unlike Franklin in 1776, he is drawing inspiration not from Moshe, but rather from Koresh. Indeed, there's an interview that Truman did about Israel amongst a lot of other things. This is a wonderful book which you could download on Kindle called Plain Speaking, which as far as I can tell, just some journalists who just sort of knocked on Truman's door and just sat down. This could never happen today. And, you know, he just spoke to her about anything that was on his mind. I mean, nowadays you have to pay $100,000 for that, for that tzachus. Um, and he says all sorts of things. But he's particularly forthright about Israel. And she writes that when they first began discussing Israel, Truman got up for a minute, left the room, and then came back. And she later learned that Truman would at times in interviews leave to have a libation, uh, which, she writes, may explain why he was so forthright uh, in discussing Israel. Or she continues to write something like, but he was enthusiastic in general about the subject of Israel, and that was it. So he talks about the Bible and his love of reading the Bible. And then he emphasizes his interest in Persia and in the entire region of the Middle East. And he says, quote, it wasn't just the biblical part about Palestine that interested me. The whole history of that area of the world is just about the most complicated and most interesting of any area anywhere. And I've always made a very careful study of it. There has always been trouble there, always been wars from the times of Darius the Great, that's one of the emperors of Persia, and Ramses on. And the pity of it, and the pity of it is, meaning the pity of the Middle East, he says, that the whole area is just waiting to be developed. And then he adds as part of his discussion, I always knew the Jews would, meaning develop it. And of course they had. So why Cyrus? Why Persia? Why does Truman all identify with this? It's possible, by the way, that this concept that he is compared to Cyrus was first suggested to him by Rabbi Herzog, who visited Truman when he was the chief rabbi of Israel. But Truman is clearly very taken with it. And the reason, I think, points to something profound. Let us put yourself, ourselves in Truman's place. He had not only miraculously come to the presidency, but he had seen as president, as vice president, and then as president, America in a few years go from an isolated nation across the Atlantic to the most supreme power on Earth. In his own presidency, he had dropped an atomic bomb, two atomic bombs, on Japan. He had reorganized Europe under the Marshall Plan, and he stood as the bulwark for the free world against the Soviets. America had begun its story like biblical Israel, a tiny nation, unimportant seemingly in the eyes of most of civilization, but having a huge impact. But that is not what America under his own presidency became. If for America, if the Hebrew Bible story is replayed in various ways in American history, and if America was no longer a small nation like biblical Israel, then it needed a different model, not of a small nation but of a superpower, but one which was still biblically inspired, one which was still playing a role in God's providential plan. What better model is there for America, for Truman, than the one played by the man who has given the last word in Tanakh? What better phrase is there to draw on America's relationship with the Hebrew Bible, but also its newfound power, than the one he ultimately uttered to Eddie Jacobson, I am Cyrus, I am Cyrus. Today, the American affinity for the story of the Hebrew Bible Woven in, once woven into the political DNA of America, is still out there if you look, still out there to be found. And it's reflected first and, foremost, first and foremost in the phenomenon of Christian Zionism and America's Christian American Christian support for the Jewish Commonwealth. I was struck by this myself when I attended Vice President Pence's speech here in the Knesset in Yerushalayim. Both the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition, when they got up to welcome the Prime Minister, the Vice President in the Knesset, both chose to cite the words of America's first Vice President, John Adams, for I long to see the Jews in Judea an independent nation. And then in his own address, one of the most Zionist speeches ever given by a non-Jew, the Vice President cited Dvarim, he cited Yeshaya, and described the birth of Israel as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It was a speech, in other words, that was filled with references to the Hebrew Bible, more perhaps than those speeches of most prime ministers in the Knesset since Menachem Begin, 
gave speeches. And as I walked out of the Knesset, an Israeli cameraman in the gallery, clearly struck by the Torah that was suffusing Pence's speech, turned to me with a jovial expression and he said to me, Zaya Mashiach Today, there exist tens of millions of non Jewish Americans, often devout Christians, who are driven by their own biblical way of looking of, at world events to be concerned, passionately concerned, for the future well being of the Jewish state. And when I was at the Knesset, and then as I pondered it later, I thought to myself, perhaps the last words in Tanakh, words given by a non-Jew about Eretz Yisrael and the Jewish return, Ko Amar Koresh, perhaps the Tanakh ending this way hints to the recognition that non-Jews in the future, as Yeshaya predicts, will come, will have, for the miracle that is Israel, will come to revere the God who dwells in Jerusalem. Koresh's last statement in Tanakh hints perhaps to an extraordinary occurrence, which is at least partially realized, a, Yish a, a partial realization of Yeshaya's prophecy today. The existence of multitudes of Gentiles who are Zionists, Americans whose attachment to Hebraic texts is the foundation of their love for the Jewish state. But that is not how all Americans feel. And the American polity is not as biblically minded as it used to be. As Stu mentioned so beautifully, we created Yeshiva University's Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought to make the case that Jewish ideas profoundly formed the Western world. But today, much of America's educated elite are utterly ignorant of the very biblical texts that once helped form the American idea and served as the foundation of Western civilization. Thus, in a speech at APEC about Israeli water technology, Prime Minister Netanyahu just made a brief reference to Moses drawing water from a rock. And the press, again, just seeking to quote him, not, not, not trying to do anything wrong, just quoting what he said, the press quoted him as describing Moses drawing water from, quote, Iraq, R-A-A-Q, I-R-A-Q. <laughs> they didn't mean to do anything bad. They just never heard of one of the most famous stories in the Torah, and didn't even know enough about the biblical story of Moses to know that he was never anywhere near Iraq. Betraying thereby total ignorance of one of the central texts of Western civilization. The American founders and many of their successors were dramatically impacted by the Tanakh, but there is no guarantee that America must remain this way. And here Cyrus offers a cautionary example. Say for Ezra reports that though Cyrus proclaimed the Jewish return and the building of the Mizbeach took place, the construction of the Mikdash was then suddenly halted for quite a few years because people began to politically assault the Jewish right to build the temple in Jerusalem and the Jewish right to establish Jerusalem as their capital again. The people of the land undermine the resolve of Yehuda and bribe ministers to thwart their plan to build all the years of Koresh. This was the first movement to lobby against the Jewish right to Jerusalem, and it existed in Cyrus's empire 2,000 years ago. A country that is moved by the story of biblical Israel can also become unmoored from the values of biblical Israel. The Cyrus that concludes the Tanakh is perhaps a hint to a future where millions of non-Jews can revere the Hebrew Bible and the land of Israel, but it is also a reminder that countries whose leaders were once inspired by the word of God, those countries can cease to be so if that biblically-based culture is not sustained. In the America of today, then, there is much to celebrate but also much cause for concern. As someone who loves David McCullough's biography of Truman, I have read parts of it maybe 50 times, I became very interested in the Sefer Torah that Chaim Weizmann gave to the president. I began to ask myself, where did this Torah come from? And what happened to it? Now McCullough does not say, and I've examined various sources, and here's essentially, as far as I can tell the story. 
When Weizmann arrived as the recently elected president of the nascent state of Israel, he asked Dr. Finkelstein, the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, which owned the Jewish Museum at the time, if he could have a menorah from the collection to give the president as a gift. Why Weizmann just didn't buy a menorah for 80,000 shekel at the silver shop in the airport, I do not know, but he had apparently forgotten to do so, so he needed a gift for the president. So he asked Dr. Finkelstein, can I have a menorah from the Jewish Museum? Finkelstein told him that the menorahs were all bequests. I'm doing this from accounts from Dr. Finkelstein's grandson as well as others who were affiliated with the seminary. These were bequests and they could not be taken, but he said, but Dr. Finkelstein suggested that he had had a Torah that had been written for his grandson's bar mitzvah. And as set out in Shoftim, Jewish kings are supposed to constantly read the Torah and learn from it. So why not give the American head of state this Torah? And that's exactly what he did. So he, they give this Torah, which had been written for Dr. Finkelstein's grandson's bar mitzvah, and then had been used by a chaplain during World War II. They gave him this Torah. Later, Dr. Finkelstein wanted his Torah back. <laughs> Not for himself, but for the Jewish Museum. That would be nice for the collection. Beautiful. The presidential Torah, you put it on display on Fifth Avenue in the Jewish Museum. And so when he met Truman, I think this is someone who worked uh, as president of the seminary, describes this. I'm taking the basic details from there. When he met Truman after the president's retirement, Dr. Finkelstein said to him something like, Mr. President, if you allow us to display the Torah in our museum, we'll have tens of thousands, or maybe even more, I don't know the precise number, in that will be see this, that can visit this Torah. And Truman responded, well, I plan for the Torah to be displayed in my presidential library, where in Independence, Missouri, where it will be seen by hundreds of thousands of people a year. So that doesn't work. So then Dr. Finkelstein tried a different tack. And he said to him something like, you know, Mr. President, according to Jewish law, the Torah has to be rolled every so often to a different place. Meaning he's implying that if you leave it in your library, that won't happen. So you should really give it to me so we can roll the Torah. And Truman points his finger at Dr. Finkelstein and says, Dr. Finkelstein, you are not getting it back. <laughs> when Truman said about the Torah, I always wanted one of these, he meant it. And if you go to the website of the Truman Library, you will see pictures of a rabbi who used to come because they would send a rabbi every so often to visit the Torah scroll to roll the Torah. So it says in the captions of the, of the, uh, the, uh, the picture of the Truman Library. And you can see Truman with the rabbi, each holding one of the Atzei Chaim, maybe together, scrolling the Torah. And there is a profound symbolism to this. We scroll through the Torah week after week because we believe that each part, each passage is precious. Each story has significance. And throughout American history, different portions of the Hebrew Bible have served as pole stars to leaders and citizens of the United States. At times, it is the tale of Yitziat Mitzrayim that spoke to America, as it did to the founders. At times, it is the image of Jerusalem that will evoke emotion, as it did for Lincoln and for Seward. And at times, it is Ezra and Koresh that will suddenly inspire, as it did for Truman. All this is for the good, as long as America, as Truman did in those pictures, continues to hold on to the Torah and allow it to help form its worldview. The question we face is whether the Hebrew Bible will continue to speak to America, or whether, as in suddenly secular Europe, it will amputate that aspect of its identity from itself. Meanwhile, if President Harry Truman adamantly kept the Torah that had been given to him, his administration, in its own way, gave the Torah back to the Jewish people. Upon the liberation of Europe, several rabbis and Jewish scholars asked the leaders of the American Armed Forces for help in publishing a copy of the Shas, of the Talmud, so that the Jews in DP camps could once again study the books that they loved so much. Now, one might have expected the army to refuse this request after the, all their job was to conquer Europe and secure the peace not go into the Jewish book business. Yet, amazingly, the army agreed, believing apparently that the preservation of Jewish civilization against totalitarian forces of evil was an essential embodiment of the American way. So the army requisitioned the printing plant in Heidelberg, which during the war had printed Nazi propaganda. And in 1948, two, uh, after two years, it published 500 sets of what is known today as the US Army Talmud, 
And thus the Truman administration marks the only time in the history of the Jewish people that a national government published an edition of the Torah Shabal Peh. I have a set of this Talmud given to me at the shul by my friend, who I think is here, Jay Pomerantz, and his wife, Hudi. And this Talmud's preference features one of the most glorious paragraphs in American Jewish history, highlighting in its own way the extraordinary link between America and the Jews. The preface reads in part as follows. This edition of the Talmud is dedicated to the United States Army. The Army played a major role in the rescue of the Jewish people from total annihilation. This special edition of the Talmud published in the very land where but a short time ago everything Jewish and of Jewish inspiration was anathema will remain a symbol of the indestructibility of the Torah. The Torah is indeed eternal, indestructible, as is the people to whom the Torah was given, the people who proclaim the Torah's ideas to the world. And America is one country where the impact of the Torah unfolded in remarkable ways. The question facing us today is, will America cling to the Hebrew Bible as it once did, or will it become a country utterly unconnected to biblical ideas? The answer is still uncertain, and it falls to those of us who live in the United States to make the case for the Bible's importance to the American future. That is why we at the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought at Yeshiva University are proud, so proud, to celebrate a book that more than any other highlights what America once was. And standing here in the Israel, first recognized by Truman, in the Jerusalem for which Lincoln yearned, and in the Jewish commonwealth of which John Adams dreamed, we hold this book out as a beacon for what America can be. Thank you very much. Thank you all.